So thank you all for joining us for the Finding the Right Faculty Advisor for You workshop. Joining us today are Dr. Joel Snyder, Professor and Director of the Neuroscience PhD program, Dr. Jessica Nave Blodgett, who is a UNLV alumni with a PhD in psychology. Um, they are going to chat with us about what to consider when looking for an advisor and how to find the right mentor um, to mentor you throughout your program. Um, I'm going to hand it over to them to tell us a bit about themselves and then we'll jump into questions. So whoever wants to get us started. Yes, you can go first if you want. Uh, you can go first. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. <laughs> well, uh, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Joel Snyder. I'm a professor in psychology at UNLV. I've been here about 14 years. Um, I do quite a bit of research, teaching, and more recently, um, some administration, as you heard about, as the uh, director of the neuroscience PhD program, which is our, uh, I guess, our first interdisciplinary cross campus PhD program here. And uh, yeah, my, my research is, is in psychology, kind of crosses the border of um, cognitive psychology and um, auditory cognition and neuroscience. Um, and yeah, I guess that's probably a good introduction for now. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I, as uh, Marlena said, am an alumni of UNLV. I got my PhD in cognitive psychology or experimental psychology in 2020. I enrolled back in 2013 in those long, heady pre-pandemic years, and actually Joel, Dr. Snyder, was one of my two advisors. I was actually co-advised by Dr. Snyder and by Dr. Hannon, and so my research is, uh, background is very similar to Dr. Snyder's, and as much as I was you know, cognitive psychology, sensation and perception with a focus on auditory cognition and auditory cognitive neuroscience, along with developmental uh, psychology and developmental cogn auditory cognitive neuroscience uh, under the direction of Dr. Hannon. And today I am a human factors scientific consultant. So I work as a scientific consultant in a large engineering and scientific consultancy company, and I work on like litigation or product related uh, or really anything litigation support with um, basically how humans interact with our built environment, whether it's automobiles, whether it's, um, you know, moving through your environment, trips and falls, things like that, or, you know, interacting with products and basically how and what does psychology and our knowledge of cognition and how people perceive their environments what does that tell us about how we interact with our built environment? And that's that's what I do. Thank you both. Um, so while our attendees think of some questions that they might want to ask you, I'm going to get us started. So um, in finding the right advisor, what are some important things to establish at the beginning of the advisor advisee relationship? Yeah, well, so let's see. So is the, is the question about like when you're still searching for an advisor? Correct. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, well, th there's a there's a lot of things uh, to take into account, but I mean the the main thing you want to be really looking for is finding an advisor who is sort of a good match for you, like someone who wants to work with you. And of course, who you want to work with, and because I, I think it's it's a very common thing. When I was applying to graduate schools, I did this a bit. You know, you, a lot of people are drawn. Well, let's let's just apply to the the most prestigious schools out there, and and find someone there who maybe does something like what I want to do. And I, I think I think that temptation is understandable because you know there, it's sort of common knowledge at least. That um, that you know, getting a, a diploma from a really prestigious school is going to help you in your career, and and that is true. Um, but I would say, at least maybe in some fields, like the extent to which you can just um, be productive and, and do well, you know, um, for example, like in our field, you know, publish papers and um, do good research. You know, that's the main thing you're going to be judged on. So. The extent to which you can find a mentor who's going to um, help you be successful in accomplishing your research, 
is going to make probably a, a much bigger difference than like what the the name of the school on your diploma is. Uh, Jessica, can you tell us a bit about your experience with finding an advisor? How did you go about researching and finding the right one? So, kind of like Joel just mentioned, um, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny. I, I actually applied to grad school two years. I was not accepted the first year that I applied because I kind of made that mistake. So I, I was the first person in my family to attend graduate school. My mom was a first gen college student and I was a first gen graduate student. So the first year I applied to grad school, I was just like, all right, what are big names? You know, what are big name schools? Just apply to them and, you know, like desperately look, you know, look at the list of faculty and is there anybody who's doing anything sort of similar and then just tried to shoehorn myself in and I, I got turned down by every school. I mean, they and some of them were very polite about it and they're like, your credentials are great, but you're, we don't really feel that you're a fit for who you're applying for or we're not really we're not really seeing you know, why you want to work with us, because that's the thing is an advisor and student relationship is is one of fit. And also, like, you, you know, they need to want to work with you just as much as you want to work with them. And part of that is having that matching interest. So in the second round, I figured out, OK, well, what I really want to do is auditory cognition. I'm really fascinated by beat perception, how we find the beat in music. So this time I went to um, society lists for the specific subfield that I was interested in, music cognition. But if it's a more general thing, like, you know, you're interested in memory, but you're interested in specific things, you can, there are other societies that you can go to that'll have lists of who are people doing research in this area. And then I started targeting it and saying, okay, well, Joel's interested in beat perception or something like really close to that. And there were other people and I started reaching out. I also had a bit better of a help uh, ad advice, advice from other people at this point, the second time around, but it, part of it was just figuring out, all right, what do I want to do? And then who does something very similar? It's never going to be a perfect match because no two people are the same. But you want to be able to make a convincing argument, even to get your foot in the door to talk to somebody that our interests do align, that we are interested in similar things, and that we could have a productive research relationship together where my ideas fit with yours. And also, I'm bringing something new to the table, so I'm able to help expand the advisor's program of research. And it doesn't have to, I, I come from an experimental background, so I'm always thinking about experimental research, but you know, you could be interested in history and a particular subtopic of history. So if you're interested in, you know, fourth century um, horseback riding techniques and what like what was going on then, maybe don't apply to a classicist who's interested, you know, or maybe don't apply to somebody who's interested in medieval history. So it, it's finding that sort of general area that you're interested in, your specific subfield, and then going from there and looking around and finding who else is in that space. And that is a much more productive place to start to then start reaching out to people and saying, hi, my name is Jessica. I come from the school. This is my interest. I'd like to speak with you, you know, maybe set up a phone call or any more a video chat. And can we just talk about your research? And I'm interested in applying. Thank you. Um, so to follow up with what Jessica just talked about, what are questions that I should ask myself and have answers to before I, I um, embark on finding the right advisor for me? Yeah, well, um, I think it's, I guess it's, it's important, you know, before you, you go about contacting people, like thinking about what are, are there any constraints like, um, you know, because you, you could, you could sort of apply all over the world, right? Because you know people are doing research all over the world, but not everybody wants to be that far away from home. Um, so kind of trying to trying to figure out, you know, what what does it, what makes sense? Because like in in some fields, um, like in our field, Jessica and I, um, it's a pretty small area, but in other areas, like if you do research on you know, in a more well-studied topic within psychology or another field. I mean, there could be a hundred places you could apply. And 
I mean, just the application fees are, are going to make that uh, not, you know, not, not possible. <laughs> Um, so yeah, try, trying to figure out like, what are your priorities? Like, are there particular parts of the world are, you know, can you narrow it down to, um, you know, uh, a certain topic that, that does have like a dozen, uh, places that you could apply to, cause that's, that's more of a, a feasible number of applications to handle. And, you know, if you get interviews at a good number of those places, you, know, you don't want to turn down so many interviews cause then it, it was probably a waste of your time to do all those applications. Um, yeah, yeah, and another thing I, I want to follow up on not exactly the, the question and, and something to reiterate something that just kind of hinted at is do not be afraid to contact people. Um, because I, I think it's also maybe a misconception that, you know, it's sort of unfair or frowned upon to contact potential mentors before you've applied um, and before they've expressed interest in you. Like, if you can get someone's attention because your research interests are so close to them, they're going to look for your application and um, you're, you're much more likely to get considered that way. And, you know, some, sometimes uh, professors won't respond to you, uh, but sometimes they will. And, you know, you can read into that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's going to be a bad mentor if they uh, don't respond to your email, um, but there's a, a good chance that they will respond if it is a good match. And, that's something that's really advantageous, I would say. So, um, connecting with that communication part, um, if we don't hear back, how often should we follow up? And do you have any tips that um, we should include in our introductory email to that faculty member? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I think it's okay to follow up um, maybe once or twice after the, the first one isn't replied to. Um, because some, yeah, some people, some people may not think it's appropriate. I don't know. I, you know, everybody is entitled to their own opinion about those kind of communications, but, uh, but most, I think most people are open to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, things to include just being specific about, you know, making it clear, you know, communicating that it's a genuine interest in their work. Uh, cause we, you know, we, we do also get a lot of contact emails from, from all over the world. And um, sometimes, you know, someone will contact you and they're like in, you know, material science. That's, that's what they did their bachelor's degree. And they apparently want to come do their PhD with you. And you're like, well, that, that's odd because you, you know, don't have any, any background for that. Uh, you'd have to like do another bachelor's degree and, or at least get some research experience in this field. So, you know, making it clear that, you know, you have the, the interest and the background that it's, it would make sense for, for you to go and study with that person and get your PhD and you'd be able to kind of hit the ground running. Um, if you, you can do that in a, you know, a brief email and, and like, like Jessica was saying, you know, raise the possibility of, of having a, a phone interview even before you apply. Um, not, not everybody's going to be receptive to that. That's probably less likely than getting an email response. Like sometimes I get, you know, emails from people expressing interest and I, I really do want them to apply. And I'll just say, oh, that's awesome. I look forward to seeing your application. Um, but I don't say, hey, let's let's talk on the phone right now, necessarily. But so, sometimes, sometimes it makes sense to do that. Thank you. Jessica, do you have anything you want to add maybe about something that you included in your introductory, introductory emails to your advisors? Um, I think Joel kind of touched on it. I did include my CV. If you don't have your CV, make a CV. If you don't have a CV, at least have a resume uh, that will show at least some relevant, uh, you know, your degree that's in progress, you know, some relevant coursework, um, some relevant research background, things like that. Um, a brief is fine. Nobody expects you to come to apply to a PhD program with like a five page CV. Nobody expects that. Um, so don't worry about, oh my goodness, I don't have enough. I'm embarrassed. No, whatever. Like this is, you know, it's a living document. It grows. It's a story of your life. Um, keep it brief. Like Joel said, um, I can tell you that no one wants to read a thousand word essay. Um, don't be so short that it, it, it's finding that sweet spot where you're communicating your message effectively without getting the overly long and wordy. Don't try to impress the person. Just be, you know, just communicate that genuine interest of, hi, this is who I am. 
this is why I'm emailing you. I'm, you know, really interested in your work. Be specific about a couple of things. Um, like Joel said, maybe not everybody goes for a video chat. Um, I think it, it never hurts to try. Uh, personally, I find that being able to physically speak or to, to actually speak to someone and really get that communication beyond just email really does help me even get a feel for it. Um, if this is a person that I could work with, I don't know, like you vibe, you vibe, you don't vibe. Sometimes, you know, you need that communication. Uh, and as Joel mentioned, you know, application fees can be expensive. Um, and also just don't take it personally if you don't get a response. Um, sometimes it's still worth trying to apply. Sometimes you don't want to, sometimes, you know, you get that vibe and you feel like, no, I don't really want to apply. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes is uh, I got a response from a person in our field who directed me to a web page that this individual had created. This is a, a person, a potential uh, advisor, and it was something like 20, 20 things you need to know about working with me. And, uh, and, you know, it does an excellent job of self-selecting because I read this person's thing and I was like, all right, you know what? I'm not sure that this is the right advisor for me, so I'm not going to pursue it any further. But I also know, having been in the field, that this person has several very successful graduate students because it's that, you know, that person just put that filter up there and let people self-select. So that's a thing that can happen too. You never really know. Um, but that's the importance of reaching out beforehand because it gave me that information to say, okay, I don't want to apply there. Partially it was because of the research interest wasn't my thing and partially because the person, you know, made a couple of things clear about interactions and mentorship style and advisor style that I'm like, okay, well, that's not what I'm looking for. So moving on. But I wouldn't have known if I didn't ask. Thank you both. Um... If there were a job description for a faculty advisor, what would it be and what should my faculty advisor be helping me with? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a long list. Um, I mean, so it's number one, uh, and, and one thing I sort of kind of under the surface is that like we, we are coming from a particular field. So like some of you may be looking at humanities or other areas that are a little bit different, but um, in, in a lot, definitely in a lot of the sciences, um, you're, you're first and foremost a collaborator and and a mentor, and and kind of those two things are very intertwined because you're you're not just um, it, it's not it's not like supervising a research project in a class where you sort of give advice like you're you're really actively um, contributing as a, as a mentor even if it's sort of just talking about ideas, but like extensively, you know, designing the research um, alongside the student. So, and, and, and like I was saying, I mean, the most important thing in most fields that you're gonna get a PhD in at least is that you're producing really high quality research. And e even though like when you're getting your PhD, you're called a student, you're really um, ideally, considered by everybody in the field, a colleague already, someone who is producing serious research that is, you know, pushing the envelope of knowledge. And so the, the research that uh, PhD students produce, you know, there, there's no asterisk by it, right? It's, it's supposed to be as high quality as what anybody in the field is producing. And, and that is made possible uh, because, you know, you're ideally working with experienced uh, scholars who know how to do that kind of research and kind of help you along and make sure that research is at that level of quality. So um, I, I'd say that's like the most important thing. And, and then the rest is sort of uh, like, a, you know, acting as an advisor, giving advice about like what classes to take. Um, and, you know, all all manner of career development issues, like, you know, when to, you know, what conference to go to to present the preliminary findings of the work. And, um, you know, once the work is farther along, if, if you're going to publish it, how to go about doing that, what journals and uh, there, there's just um, 
I mean, the thing about like if you're doing a PhD and and really getting enmeshed in in the particular field of research, like you're you're learning so many different skills uh, just to be a researcher. And then, of course, when you're graduate school, a lot of people do do teaching as well and mentoring of their own because they're in a lot of science labs. There's going to be undergraduates who are helping out with the research for credit or for pay, and the graduate students are often you know, mentoring them as much or even more than the faculty um, just because of, uh, you know, logistical reasons. Like, you know, some labs might have 10 or 20 undergraduates contributing to various projects and it, it's just not possible for one professor to hands-on mentor all that many people, even though, you know, those those students need mentoring and uh, it's it's kind of a good situation because graduate students can help with the oversight of what's happening in the lab and they also get experience with mentoring which is you know important not just if you're going to go into academia but if you're going to go into the private sector or government as well jessica is there anything you want to add that maybe your faculty advisors um did for you outside of what dr snyder already said i mean i first want to echo um skill development professional development, career development, and scaffolding. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing, is that in all of these cases, your advisor is scaffolding you from, you know, stepping out of an undergraduate role where you are assisting, but you are not really driving things. And your advisor is scaffolding you to the point where you are really the one in the driver's seat. You are the one that is developing, executing, interpreting and then presenting and really contributing to the greater body of knowledge of your field and your your advisor is ideally providing that scaffold and helping lift you up as you build those skills so that by the end of it you know you, you truly are a full colleague i mean you're a colleague from the beginning but you know so the advisor is kind of you know you can think of it as running behind the kid with the training wheels on and you take the training wheels off and eventually the kid rides off on the bike by their own i mean ideally by the end of it we're riding the bike on our own and it's that scaffolding that the advisor provides um and that and and also and so relatedly that acceptance uh there's there's a level of altruism unselfishness and like true just support and encouragement for you to grow as a person and to blossom or grow or you know unfold into the professional uh you know scholar scientist practitioner that you are and that unselfishness of knowing that your success as their advisee is also their success as an advisor and you know like really helping push you forward lift you up and being proud of you standing on your own by the end and that's that's a really important it's part of the job description but also part of what makes a really good advisor is that ability to to like constantly assess and constantly sort of renegotiate like the balance the the amount of help and sort of fine tune that based on each student's particular needs, where they are in their training, what the situation is. And that's sort of, you know, we're jacks of all trades, you know, our advisors are jacks of all trades, we're, you know, the Swiss army knife, you know, by the end of the, your PhD, you should be a Swiss army knife that can, you know, do anything and conquer anything because you've conquered the PhD and that's going to be one of the most difficult things you'll ever do in your professional life. And your advisor is, helping you and using their expertise, using their professional networks to help you, using their experiences to, to guide you, but not stuff you down or overwhelm you or like, if, if, like press their worldview on you. It's, you know, gentle shaping, gentle direction, lifting without, you know, stamping an imprint on someone. That's not really a good description of a job description but I think it's a good description of like what makes a truly effective advisor. Thank you both so much for that insight, um, super helpful. I just want to remind um, our attendees to feel free to ask our panelists any questions that you might have about finding a faculty advisor. I know most of our attendants are undergrads that are interested in applying to grad school. So again, please feel free to type in the chat or you can directly chat me and I will ask on your behalf. 
So it looks like we did receive a question in the chat. Um, is it possible for us to meet that advisor's current students and get an idea about their experience? Is that a norm in any field? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it is, I think it is quite normal, at least what I've observed. Um, I often encourage people applying to work with me to contact people who are in my lab now. And, and also, you know, if you get invited to interview for a position, uh, especially if you come and make a, a visit to the campus, which before the pandemic was very, very normal, you know, there, there are events where you get to talk to graduate students in the program and in the specific uh, research group you're applying to work with. So uh, without any faculty presence, so you can be candid. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, that's very normal and also just making direct contacts with individual students. So you can be even more candid without a, a group atmosphere. I think that's very normal. Um, I, I'm sure, you know, there are some professors who feel like that's not advantageous to them. So if you feel like they're, they're sort of hiding their graduate students from you and they don't want you to, commu to communicate with them, I would say that would be a pretty big red flag. So, sort of stemming off that, um, what are some good questions we should ask current students of that advisor? Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll let uh, Jessica take that one. I, <laughs> I'm a little too far removed from that. Yeah, well, now, now I have to be like, oh, put myself back in that mindset. Um, what's your day-to-day -day workload look like? What, because um, I mean, you ask any PhD student, how are you doing? And a lot of us will answer tired, stressed, overwhelmed, ah, that sort of thing. And hopefully the PhD student that you're talking with will also be able to put that aside because that's, you know, unfortunately sometimes the norm in the PhD. But, you know, what's your workload? How often do you meet with your advisor? What's your working relationship with your advisor? How do you how do you feel? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel heard? Do you feel like if you needed to reach out to your advisor, you know, that they would answer? Do you feel like you could go to your advisor and say, hey, I'm having a serious family problem and I need to take a little bit of time is, you know, do you feel like that would be okay? Um, just, you know, ask them about their experiences. Are you happy? Do you feel like you have a real voice, you know, professionally in your work? Do you, you know, do you feel like you have ownership over the projects that you're in? Or do you feel like things are handed to you? What's the atmosphere of the lab? Because sometimes that can come down, you know, like things can come down from the advisor in terms of like there are labs out there and I would suggest you avoid them where everyone like holds onto their own project and you're constantly worried about other people scooping you in your own lab where like people in your own lab are not, are, are basically playing hardball against each other, which by the way, try to stay out of those labs, not a good idea, not a great place. Um, you know, so get a feel for the lab culture in general, because in a way that also trickles down from the top and that's sort of an indirect temperature of what working under that faculty advisor is like. Um, you can ask about like, do you have free time? You know, how many hours do you spend or like how often are you working in the lab? Is it an expectation that you work till midnight, which totally didn't happen with me because I'm in bed at like 8.30 p.m. Um, you know, is there an expectation that you work seven days a week? You know, just, these are all questions that you can ask and, and also in if you're not getting answers from even the grad students, like Joel said, that's kind of a red flag. So it's something that you should really pay attention to. Um, but I mean, you, as long you can ask a lot of questions, feel free to, because these, because this is going to be your lived experience. This is going to be what you, you know, the environment theoretically that you could be in. And you want to make sure that it's an environment that you will do well in, you know, professionally, that you will do well in for your mental health, your physical health, you know, your all around life, not just the time that you spend in lab working or in the library or in front of your computer working on your or teaching or whatever, working on your PhD. Oh, yeah. Ask about teaching. Ask about opportunities. Um, sorry, I'm just throwing them all out there. More are coming. Ask your ask the ask the grad students like, do you have opportunities to present at conferences? Do you have opportunities to do posters? Do you have travel funding from your department? Um, what's your stipend like? Oh my goodness! Ask what your stipend is like. You know, do you you know, 
what are there housing um you know like is, is there grad student housing or what's the housing market like i mean right now the housing market is miserable everywhere but you know like are there are there any sort of assistance programs is there any sort of like dedicated grad student housing um just anything you could think to ask about what your life would be like if you were there. Feel free to ask it. It may be a lot, and I know sometimes I wasn't always the best at answering every single question, but it also tells you something how much the grad students are willing to share with you. I think those are great questions, Jessica. Thank you so much. I think you you had some really good suggestions. Um, it does look like we have another question in the chat. When you do get a faculty advisor, how often should you meet with them? And then what is the difference between a faculty advisor for a master degree and then a faculty advisor for a doctorate degree? Yeah, that's a, those are good questions. Um, I, I think there, there's quite a bit of variability, um, but sort of my approach, which, which has evolved a lot over the years, is, is to really encourage, almost demand, that um, PhD students I'm working with meet with me at least every other week, uh, one on one, and uh, or or like like in, in Jessica's case uh, where there were two advisors we met the three of us pretty regularly, um, and but I used to I used to sort of just leave it up to the student like some students they they didn't want to meet unless they really needed to talk about something and sometimes that worked and. Um, but yeah, I think I, I've come to the conclusion that trying trying to meet regularly is is a good idea. Not necessarily every week, although I, I do I do now have some students who really like to do that, or at least they like to have me on the calendar. So if they need to meet with me, they'll they'll be there, and if not, they'll say actually I don't need to meet this week. And I think that's a, a pretty good system as well because you know sometimes you're you're working on something like. You know, writing a computer program and it takes three weeks and you don't need to talk to anybody until until that's done. Um, and so that, yeah, that's kind of in, in terms of like with PhD students. And the, the master's degree thing is a, a good question because I think there's a lot more variability. Like there, there's a lot of master's degrees out there where you're not expected to do um, original research or other than like, you know, maybe, you know, library research, reviewing past studies, but, um, if it is a master's program, like a, maybe a 2 year master's program where you are expected to do a thesis project. Where you're, you're, you know, collecting data and, you know, probably going to publish it. It's sort of like a shorter version of a PhD in that case, you know, it, it should be pretty similar to. You know how you meet with a PhD advisor, uh, but there there are a lot of master's programs that are sort of meant for people who just need a little bit more coursework or um, just a little bit more time to apply to to graduate programs. I I did a I spent some time at University of Chicago and they have a really unique master's program there, and they accept lots of people into it. They probably make a lot of money on it, honestly. So you have to be careful about how much you're getting charged for master's programs, because often it's you paying. Uh, whereas that's not true with most PhD programs, but yeah, like in, in that situation, they, there was a research component. So students came into this master's program and they, they got assigned to labs and they, they did, you know, small 1 year research projects, but it was very, very fast, you know, just 1 year to get a small little bit of research done. And um, it, I, I'm assuming in those cases, faculty had ideas for students to, to get started as opposed to, you know, the, the longer period of time we allow for PhD students to kind of develop their own ideas. Um, but, and then there, like I said, there would be other master's programs where you might not even have much uh, of an advisor mentee relationship because it's just like, do this coursework, get through the program, and get your degree and then go do a, a PhD where you, you would have a, a mentor who's working with you on research. So, yeah, with master's programs, you really have to do, you know, really do your homework and figure out what, what, is, what is this master's program about or what kind of master's program do I want? Um, do I want to do a research project that might get published before I do my PhD or is it enough to just get some experience um, 
you know, with uh, with coursework. Like, I actually have a student who's going to be starting in a PhD program in the fall, and he took he just took a year off after getting um, the the bachelor's degree, and he's doing a data science program, which is sort of like just learning how to use different kinds of software like R and Python. Um, and there's no expectation that they're they're going to do any you know research project, but it, you know something like that could be good preparation uh, to to help you. Um, Again, hit the ground running when you start your PhD. Thank you. Um, how far in advance of submitting applications should I start reaching out to potential advisors? Yeah, that's um, well, like like in in the programs I'm affiliated with here at UNLV, our deadlines are December first, and um, I mean, really, it could be. Any time over the summer, but certainly, you know, maybe, maybe in September when people are like back in the office and available and answering email is, is a good time to get started. And that way you have time if they don't respond to your first email, then you can, uh, you can uh, send them another message in October. But, so, yeah, a few, maybe a few months ahead and, and then that would also leave time in, in case they want to talk to you over the phone or on uh, on zoom. It would also give you time as a, uh, as the applicant to, because you don't, once again, you know, I, I, I took two years to get into grad school and I was a first gen grad student. Um, my first year, I was just desperately trying to slam out my deadlines at the last minute and the quality of work suffered. You want to give yourself time to complete the applications mm -hmm. as best as possible. And you do want to take that time to tailor your personal statement. Um, if there are any other statements, whether it's like a diversity statement or a research statement, I mean, everybody is different uh, in terms of like schools differ on what they want, but you want to make sure that your materials are tailored to the people you're applying to. So give yourself enough lead time to know I'm going to apply to this, these six to eight to 10 people um, and be able to tailor those application materials uh, to each person respectively. So like Joel said, you know, definitely summer, early September, I, I wouldn't go any later than that for at least initial contact so that by early October, you have your short list or your hit list of people who you're applying to, and you can really focus on those materials. And since you are not just doing this alone, you're relying on other people to give you references you can give them the lead time of saying, I will be applying to these schools and I'll be applying to these people at these schools well ahead of time. And you can give them your materials because I understand this isn't part of the question, but when you're asking people to give you references for graduate school, the more information you can give them, the better letter they can, the better work they can do for you. And if you can give them your pretty much prepared CV, if you can give them your pretty much prepared personal statement, they will have a better, they will be able to craft a better letter for you. And they will also appreciate not being asked to do this a week before the deadline. Thank you. What um, what kinds of expectations do advisors usually have for their advisees, and what standards should I hold, uh, be holding myself to? Yeah, um, well, like I was saying before, I mean, you you really want to strive. Like when you start a program, and um, you, you really want to strive to be productive. I mean, if uh, if the first task in terms of the research is to, you know, read a bunch of papers and really try to understand the field you're getting involved in, I mean, really do that. Don't don't just read one or two papers, but really read them and read them carefully and sometimes read certain papers multiple times to really get um, to, to really get the most out of it and understand because what what you want to do, what, what any scholar wants to do, regardless of whether you're a student or a you know, an old professor is, you know, kind of build a model of the knowledge in that field. And, you know, the, the, the model of the knowledge, like what, what is known, what are the important questions? What are the theories that try to explain, you know, the, the knowledge that's out there? Um, once you, 
you really want to be able to construct that in your mind. So it, it's not that, you know, sometimes you can approach it like, well, I want to study this particular topic and there's this one really cool study that someone did. So I'm going to read that and then do, you know, do something to advance past that. Um, you know, you, you can do that and what you do may be useful to the field, but if you, like I said, if you don't really enmesh yourself and, and build that knowledge inside yourself, you're, you're going to be very limited in terms of the contribution you can make because um, there's so many different ways to think about um, what's known in a certain field. And if you don't have a really unique take on it and use that unique reading of the field to progress in a, a, a certain direction that's useful and insightful, um, you know, people aren't going to be that interested in your work probably. And it may be hard to stay in that research field because uh, if you're not making that really um, unique contribution, then people might not see the value of what you're doing. Um, so it's really, really important, like, like PhD, doing a PhD is like a, a full-time job and a half probably. <laughs> and, it, and it's not to say that, you know, you have to work 80 hours a week, but he, I think it's really important to be goal oriented to say, well, this is what I want to accomplish, you know, this week, this month, this year, throughout my whole PhD and, and do, you know, whatever it takes within some, you know, limitations, like take care of yourself, of course. Um, but, but you, you kind of have to do what it takes to get the job done. And I, I think a, a really good, um, analogy is like when you look at really successful athletes, I mean, they're, they're not just doing it, you know, going through the motions, like the ones who really excel and, and make a mark, you know, they're putting in whatever work it takes to get to the level they want to get to. And um, so I think it's really important to sort of have that kind of goal and um, and to put in the work that's necessary to to accomplish those short, medium and long term goals. And um, that, that's where it's good to have an advisor because they can help guide you in terms of what should the priority be in terms of what you're working on uh, the most. Um, and, and usually the answer, you know, the the. The broad answer will be, you know, work on your research, <laughs> even if you have some teaching duties, make sure you're spending enough time on your research to keep making progress little by little all the time. Um, and th that's, I think, the, the, the best way to kind of approach it, because it's um, and, and it's, you know, when you put it that way, like you, you make little progress, uh, you know, each week, it adds up to amazing things like like what. What Jessica accomplished, uh, you know, in her PhD, you know, publishing really major papers that I, I think are are going to be, um, you know, respected for a long time. Um, you know, it's it's very doable, but if you allow yourself to say, well, this week I, I'm just going to, you know, focus on my stats homework, and maybe next week I'll, I'll focus more on, you know, setting up this research project. Uh, if you allow yourself to do that, I, I think it's. Um, you're not going to be successful. And so I think the message is, yeah, you have to work really hard, but it's very doable. You just have to get in the right habit and make sure you're constantly making progress on the, the main point of your PhD, which is almost always going to be, you know, your research projects. To sort of echo and piggyback on that, I think there's a bit of a mindset shift. It's, it's a very different mindset in a PhD program or in one of the research oriented master's programs compared to undergraduate. In undergraduate, everything's about your classwork and it's about completing the tasks that are handed to you. Once you enter a PhD program, the expectation is you will still have classwork and the expectation is you will do well in that classwork, um, but that's not enough. Um, the real focus is becoming that internally driven, you know, producer, consumer, and, um, you know, like creator of research and taking from a re changing from a sort of reactive mindset where, you know, someone hands me something, I do it. And then I sit there and I wait for the next assignment. And in the meantime, I go, okay, I got that done. Wait till the next thing. Now you are actively seeking out 
uh, what is the next thing I'm doing? You create those goals, you accomplish those goals. And in the meantime, stay in communication with your advisor. Just, you know, let them know what you've been doing, what you've been accomplishing them. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Try and solve things yourself. Try and make progress yourself, but also don't be afraid to check in and say, hey, am I going down the right path? Because you might not, and that's okay. Because that's another thing. Don't be afraid of failure. The only way to never fail is to never try. If you are not failing, it means you're not pushing. It means that you're not trying. It means that you're not out there doing things because none of us are perfect and none of us get it right on the first try. Well, sometimes we do, most of the time we don't. And if science, you know, science isn't the business or really any generation of knowledge is not the business of what we already know. It's the business of figuring out what we don't know. And that's going to have false starts and that's going to have mistakes. And you're building experience by doing these things and by not being afraid to get out there, to try to pick yourself back up after a reviewer rejects your paper and says a bunch of nasty things, because unfortunately that's going to happen. Or, you know, your advisor sends your draft back and it's, you know, more red ink than you'll ever want to see in your life. And you know what, you know, you take a deep breath, you go, gosh, darn it, you know, you maybe cry a bit, you go run around the block, you do whatever it takes, and then you come back and you're like, all right, I'm going to keep moving forward because my goal is getting that PhD or my goal is publishing that paper or my goal is even if it's just figuring out what error is going on in my computer code and getting my computer code to run so I can get that experiment. And then I can move on to getting the data and then I can move on and having those goals and setting those goals and keeping going, finding your way of internally rewarding yourself, because that's the, that's one of the things about a PhD or, you know, higher education is the, the pats on the back, the kudos, the rewards, they are few and far between. You need to figure out a system that works for yourself to keep yourself motivated in the interim, in the short term, in the medium term, so that you can get to that day uh, where you get to stand on the stage and get hooded, except screw you COVID, I didn't get that, but that's okay, I still got the PhD. And part of that is really finding that internal drive, that internal desire, and then keep it to, to keep going, to set those goals, to learn things, to say, I want to do this. I'm doing this because this is something I want, even when the going gets tough, because it will get tough, moving forward, picking yourself up when you fall, staying in contact with your advisor, asking for help when you need, asking for help from, for, you know, advice from other grad students, not being afraid to try but just remembering that you are now, you're in the driver's seat and you are the one who's driving your graduate career forward. No one is going to hand anything to you anymore. You have to go out and seek it. And you have to maybe like, you have to learn to relish that challenge. You got to do what it takes and learn to love it. And there is a lot to love because there's so much intellectual freedom. There's so much that you get out of this. But anyway, that's, a, that's another topic. And, and it's really, I mean, it's really, I mean, that this, this issue is really the reason you want to carefully decide what you want to study. Because like a lot of, I think it's fairly common for people to be like, well, I know I don't want a normal nine to five job after I get my bachelor's degree. So I'm just going to go to grad school and keep doing stuff. Um, and that, that's not going to be like, if, 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 you know, if, if you have that mindset, it's going to be hard to motivate yourself to, to do the work because what, what you really want to do is figure out what's, you know, what's the problem I want to solve in science or in society. And, you know, the, the world of research is so diverse. Like there's so many things you can study and, and some people want to study something very obscure and like, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how the brain works and, you know, there, there are some applications to that to health and technology, but mostly I, I'm just very excited by understanding how, how the brain works um, and, and how we appreciate music and understand other kinds of sounds. But, you know, other, other people want to, you know, prevent the spread of disease or help people recover from strokes. And like, if you identify that problem that you, you can really imagine being passionate about and trying to come up with unique solutions and and research and generate knowledge about that then that's going to drive you to do all those mundane things from day to day 
And so that, that's really why it, it's so important to identify what you're passionate about and, and make sure you, you understand that you really want to um, be the driving force behind solving problems in society or solving theoretical questions in some area of basic science or, or the humanities. And to circle it back around to an advisor, the important thing is finding an advisor who can help you do those things and is in and is interested in helping you do those things and collaborating with you. Because just as it's important for you to find your fire, your passion, and the problem you want to solve, you also make sure want to make sure that you've got the advisor or have an advisor who is equally like as gung ho about, yeah, get at it, Jessica. You figure out how you know kids perceive beat or whatever it is. You know, you, you also want to have that advisor that is there and supporting you and like aligns with your professional, your career goals, and you know, is also just like a personality fit with you too. Um, if at some point in the advisor advisor advisee relationship, I decide that my advisor and I are not a good fit, how should I go about communicating that? What would my next steps be? Is it possible to change advisors? And is this a very rare situation? No, it's it's not a rare situation. Um, I mean, ideally, the advisor you start with ends up being good because it's you know it's stressful. Um, like like you know your faculty advisor does does have a certain amount of power over you, and and hopefully they they are looking for your best interests and if. Uh, you know, if it's not working out, hopefully they realize that as well and help you find another situation. Um, and, and, you know, a, a good thing to do, and I was encouraged to do this by the faculty at the school I went to for reasons. Um, but, you know, sometimes the faculty or other students will encourage you to make sure you have a backup plan that, oh, okay, well, you want to work with this faculty member, but if it doesn't work out, there's this other person and you'd be happy to work on research related to their interests um, and their or their expertise. Um, so it's I think it, it's good, you know, if you and, and not just as a backup plan, but you know, if there are multiple faculty at the department you're gonna be training in, uh, you know, th those are people you could take classes from or you know have informal interactions with as well. Um, or or do side projects, you know, there's no reason you can't do, you know, work with multiple faculty members on completely different things as long as, you know, it's it's beneficial to, to everybody involved. Um, so, yeah, but um, it, can, can you say the, the original part of the, the first question? Just so. Yeah, um, if, if I did, uh, sorry. Uh, da, da, da. What should my next step be? If I decide that I'm not a good fit, how do I go about communicating that? I think that's the part you're looking yeah, for. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would say in general, if things are not working out, hopefully it is apparent to both parties and, you know, what to do about that, that, that could be where there might be some conflict or bad feelings because, you know, um, you know, it's easy as an advisor or as the student to blame the other party, like it's not working out because you're doing this or that. So um, you should change that, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it, I, I don't know the best, uh, the best advice. It's, uh, it, it can be tricky though. <laughs> maybe, maybe Jessica has more insight. Um, so, number one, always remain respectful, professional, and collegiate, you may no longer work with this individual as an advisee, but if you maintain, you know, if you stay in the same field, this person will eventually be your colleague. Um, so, you know, try not to make it a really messy breakup, so to speak. And, and you don't have any control over what the other person would or what the advisor is doing. You only have control over yourself. Um, so just make sure that, you know, no matter what, you're able to maintain professionalism and, you know, communicate in a respectful manner. Um, you know, whether, you know, maybe you need to go have, you know, a venting session with your bestie, but don't, but, but have that elsewhere. 
um, go to the graduate coordinator. So there are people both at like at the graduate college level and also in your department that you would go speak with. Um, you know, like even before initiating a possible change of advisor, there are people in your department and also higher up that are there for you to speak with, to advise you on graduate college policy, um, or, you know, like departmental policy who can facilitate any discussions can actually sit in on sort of, um, what's the word, um, but basically discussions between you and, you know, your, your advisor about potentially uh, changing that relationship and you moving to a different advisor, um, you know, and once again, you know, be, be honest, but also be, you know, collegial, polite, professional, respectful, um, speak with, you know, like Joel said, kind of feel out, hopefully at this point, you've kind of felt out other people in your department, potentially, that could be a secondary or a new advisor for you, um, have discussions with them. Once again, it's kind of like when you quit, you know, when you quit a job and you're interviewing for a new job, it's usually considered a red flag if you like totally trash the previous job you were at. You know, once again, don't do that. You know, professional, collegiate, respectful, but you're allowed to say, you know what, this is just not working out and that's okay. Um, you can go to another advisor. Hope, I mean, we're all human, but hopefully there will be no hard feelings or at least every party involved can remain professional and respectful. If there's no one in your department that is able to, that is close enough in research, it, sometimes you can, you know, basically apply to another school and apply to work with someone else. That absolutely happens. And I think internally, the biggest thing is like, don't blame yourself and don't think that there's anything like, you know, that you did anything wrong or that you're not good enough or like, try not to internalize it because we're all human. We all like, sometimes things just don't work out and it's not the end of the world. And it's certainly not the end of your PhD career and like, try to maintain. That's a big thing is like trying to maintain that internal equilibrium of this is a challenge, but I am going to get through it. This is not the end of my career and I'm going to have a productive uh, career. Even after this adjustment, it's just like changing lanes on the freeway or taking an exit. Um, and getting on a different freeway. Um, the biggest thing is just maintain that professionalism and go speak with people who can advocate for you and who can help you navigate through this process, like your uh, program coordinator, anybody at the grad college, things like that. Perfect. Um, so before we end today's session, we would like to thank both our panelists for their time and their expertise with us today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, before you all log off, if you could just take a few minutes to fill out the workshop feedback survey I just dropped in the chat, um, we would really appreciate it. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you all.